the big news today, Rob, was that the that ESPN is going to release its documentary. Remember, there it's been all the talk is about this 10 part documentary that ESPN is going to do on the Bulls. Michael Jordan's last Chicago Bulls team that won the championship, you know, a second three-peat. And it's called The Last Dance. Well, the big news is that because uh, everybody's home for the coronavirus, they are going to, instead of releasing it on June 2nd, they are going to do it on April 9th. I think it's a really smart business move. I mean, we may be home on June 2nd too, but man, I mean, you you talk about a captive audience right now. It is the perfect time for them to release it. I think that's a great idea. And here's what I want to throw at you, Rob. Why are we so fascinated? And I think everyone's fascinated with the Michael Jordan Bulls teams. This is the second three-peat now. I have an answer if you want me to give you mine first. Go ahead. My answer is Michael Jordan was the best player ever, and we don't need to talk about that and discuss that. And also, I'm going to say that Bulls team, and I'm not saying the 97-98 team, but I'm I'm putting that whole second three-peat together that had the nucleus of Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Dennis Rodman, and you can throw in Ron Harper if you want. That Bulls team, Tony Kukoc as well, is the best team in NBA history. They won 72 games in 96. That was the most ever until Golden State went ahead and won 73. But unlike the Warriors, the Bulls finished the deal and won the championship. And then they went on a route, a run where they won the next three, never went seven games. For those that want to say, well, they were perimeter-oriented, how would they handle big men? This was the best era of big men in NBA history. They beat Shaq and Penny. And remember, Penny, the millennials might not know, Penny Hardaway, before his knee injury, was phenomenal. He was on his way to a Hall of Fame career, period, the end. So he's a healthy Penny. This is Shaquille O'Neal. They beat them in the playoffs. They beat Patrick Ewing in the playoffs. They beat Alonzo Mourning in the playoffs. David Robinson and Hakeem Olajuwon were in the West. They didn't have to play them in the playoffs, but they played them in the regular season. So they had bigs, a Luke Longley, uh, a, a Bill Winnington, who weren't really good players, but they were seven-footers who you could, and they were bodies you could throw at big men, whether it was Kareem from the Showtime Lakers. Because remember, Rob, with the Showtime Lakers, it was the second half of Kareem's career. So for the last two, maybe three championships that they won, Kareem was past his prime. I'm not saying these bigs that, and you know, the, the Bulls had several others. Every year they get somebody, John Sally one year, Bill uh, uh, Bison Dele one year. Joe Klein one year to be that third yep. third part of the three-headed monster. They just throw bodies at you and wear you down, pick up fouls and all that. And then they were devastating on the perimeter offensively and defensively. Rob, I think they were the best team ever. It's hard to argue with that because of all the other elements that go in. Even though the Warriors won one more game, it just it pales in comparison because you have to finish the job. Yes. I, I don't care. You just have to. You know, I always yeah, talk about I that. Agree. You know, getting up to the Playboy Mansion, hanging out on the stoop. Nope. If you don't get in, Chris, it's a failed mission. You didn't get there. And that's, that's right. what the Bulls were able to do. They got in. They won. And it, it goes in with everything that Michael Jordan was attached to. You could talk about so many different players, but he was so special. And they use that term way too much nowadays to anybody. Oh, he's special. Oh, he's special. Oh, he's... No, Michael Jordan was really special. And I feel pretty happy that I was able to cover Michael Jordan during that time. Right. I, I, was, in, I was on the NBA trenches. Not, not that year, Chris. I was already a columnist by that time. But you know what I'm saying? 
Yep. I, during I, his career. During, during his, his career. Heyday. And I yep. right. And I was in Detroit during that. I covered the the famous Scottie Pippen game with the ice pack on his head, you know, uh where he didn't play that game seven, Chris, or maybe right. played a minute or whatever it was. Against the Pistons. Against the Pistons. And yep. that was at the Silver yep. Dome. I, I covered that game. I was working in New York. I wasn't even working in Detroit then. Uh, I was there when he made that shot against Craig Elo. I could just go on and on and on. And I watched that whole era, and I knew it was something definitely special and different. And uh, I think that's why people are attached. Uh, Michael Jordan will always be one of those iconic figures because there's perfection. And that doesn't mean that he did everything right and, and everything was – but the 6-0, and won all six MVPs, and then – all the other stuff that he did, the the uh, individual accomplishments as well. Yeah. When you put it all together, it is something to behold. It is something to want to watch. It is something you want to cherish and remember. And all the millennials and all the young sports writers and, and sports analysts, Chris, who always are trying to prop up LeBron, and I'm not saying he's not a great player and all that, but the reason, and this is what I, this is just my personal opinion, the reason they do that is they feel like it's hard to be that NBA voice and that NBA guy when you didn't see the greatest guy who ever played. You know, you got YouTube. Mm. I really believe that. So they want LeBron to be the greatest so that they can have that, you know. So you talk, are you talking about, like, a lot of the writers now? Yeah, the younger I do. Writers, All the younger writers. Who more fans? Who don't, okay. Yeah, who don't, know, who, don't know Mike, who don't know Michael Jordan. You know what I'm saying? Really? Yeah, and, and look, it's something that's You think that's, that's natural, crazy or right? no? No, no, I don't think it's crazy. I, I don't know if it's because they consciously feel like we have to have, you know, a scene, and we have to have seen the greatest player of all time to really be the aficionados that we want to be, or if it's just the natural inclination of somebody you saw but you know you what? know Hit, but here's because um, you and i we quick. didn't see oscar and you know uh so we don't talk about those guys as the as the best ever although I, a lot of these writers they did see jordan they were younger and they were younger so usually when you see somebody as a child it's an elevated image in your mind you know what i mean yeah i i, I just think See, I never looked at it like that. Like, I didn't have to see one. I didn't have to see Babe Ruth at all to just look at the numbers, Chris, during the time he played. I, I always look at it like that. I, I don't feel like I'm cheated or I didn't see some of the great players who played during that time, but I do recognize them and, and their accomplishments. In Michael Jordan's case, it's just so hard for someone to make a case against him. I just, I, I, and that's, Chris, I because, think that's as you my— you said, the perfection— do you know what I'm saying? Like, yep. like, what's the case? He won 10 straight scoring championships. He has the highest scoring average of anyone who ever played in the playoffs. He never got to a game seven. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where, where's the hole. Uh, there's 10 Hall of Famers we can name who never got a taste of a championship. How, because of him, yeah. Do you, do you know what I mean, Chris? Where? Tell He's me where. Got, where's the I, I, hole? No, there is none. You're out, and there's no hole in his game either. There's no hole. He he played defense. Uh, he 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 changed from a dunker to an outside shooter. He did. What he did could he pass. do? There was a year he averaged eight assists. They put him at point. He averaged thirty-two, eight and eight against hand checking. He became a great mid-range shooter. Had a post game. Was decent at the three point line. I mean, again, nobody really paid that much attention to it and, back then. But and the other one is became pretty good at it. The the way that they played defense back then, and the Knicks and the Pistons, they beat them up. Right, you remember that? There were yep. no superstar calls from Michael. He, if you went to the lane and you went to the lane, Michael Jordan or not, you were getting hammered. hammered. I was just remember I said the other night I was watching the fifty five point game against the Knicks. And there was a play where he beat Stark's baseline, went up for the dunk, and Ewing, to your point, hammered him. Seven-foot Patrick Ewing hammered him. Jordan went down hard. It was just a foul. Not today, it would have the game would have been stopped for eight yeah. minutes. It would have been a flagrant, you know, two. Ewing would have maybe been suspended. <laughs> I mean, it just, you know, that's just how it is. And he took all that. And I'm gonna say something else, Rob. This is for Rob G, too, because he's, you know. He hates on the old school players. 
the Bulls were kind of, when you watch the games, like to, you watch in the 80s, the Showtime Lakers, the Bird Celtics, so on and so forth, and the game was very much centered right around the paint. And so there were a lot of a lot of times where guys would be have wide open 18, 19 footers and not take them. You know, the defense was giving them that and they wouldn't take it. Then today, obviously, the game is really spread out and it's no nothing in the paint. It's all revolves around the three point line. The 90s, if you watch it, was kind of the in between. Like, it wasn't as close to the paint as it had been in the 80s, but obviously it wasn't as spread out as today. So you had kind of that in-between. The three-pointer was more prominent than it had been in the 80s. And I also think the athleticism in the 90s was better than the 80s, not as good as now, but it was, a, it was like really good athleticism combined with team play. Like, now you got a lot of athleticism but not a lot of team play outside of a Golden State and the San Antonio and a few other teams. But then you had athleticism. I mean, we, the team that you could put up against the Bulls, Rob, is Golden State with Durant and Steph and Clay. I can make an argument that the Bulls of Jordan Pippen, Rodman, Harper were more athletic than them. Don't you think? I do. I really do, and I think Steph, people. Yeah, I just I mean, think I just think people are so caught up on what was going on in the circus and the Warriors that they just us, you know, like wanted to always put them ahead. And I just don't see it. I really don't. With the way, and obviously it's two different eras. How you're playing, hand check, touching right. people. Well, that, I, I get all that. Thing, yeah. yeah, I get all that. And look, the the Warriors were an all time great team. I mean, I'm talking about the second crew with. Durant, Steph, and Clay, and Draymond. I mean, that's a great team. There's no question about it. Um, to me, that's the that's the argument. Uh, but what do you think? 877-99 on Fox, 877-996-6369. Are the Jordan Bulls the greatest team in NBA history? It's your turn to weigh in as we continue this conversation with you next. All right, let's kick it off with Tim in Fort Lauderdale. You're on the Odd Couple Fox Sports Radio. What's up, Tim? Hey, guys. First of all, I don't know who you are, but get uh, get the Odd Couple back in there. There's a love fest going on in there. You guys haven't disagreed with each other since the show started. I'm not used to that. You guys you're right. are going at it. You know what? You're right. <laughs> you're, you're, right. <laughs> you're right on this one. Yeah. It's, it, it's refreshing, though. Hey, uh, the Jordan Bulls. Uh, even if they played the way they play today, it, it would be they would be even better. Are you kidding me? Uh, and, and and you hit a nerve too. I'm 56. I'm with you guys. The Zers, the the Xers, the Millennials. They have no idea. The, the Jordan Bulls, absolutely, guys. Thank you. No yep, doubt. Good call. Good call. No doubt, Tim. Appreciate it. How about Douglas in Dayton? Is that Dayton, Ohio? You're on the Odd Couple Fox Sports Radio. Yeah, it's Dayton, Ohio. There hey, you go. Uh, I guess there's only, is, there's only one Dayton, Dayton, Ohio. Well, All I know <laughs> of. The only one I know of. Okay. Well, there's more, but that's the main one right here now. All right. Go hey. ahead. Hey, man, I'm 65 years old, and I've been watching NBA from the time when the, when Boston played, with KC Jones hit them bank shots, and yep. when they had the delay in the 70s, you know, for the final, you had to wait till 11 o'clock to see yep. the doggone game and stuff, man. But – when Jordan was playing in the last three years, man, it was just like, and you had cable TV, and every game was on TV, you know, on WGN. Well, yeah. I mean, it was like a season ticket, you know. So, I mean, I tell my son, and uh, I mean, that was a, that was a great team, man. That was one heck of a one best heck of a team, team, best team, and ever one in heck your of view? player, buddy. Best you know. team ever in your view. Say what now? Best team ever in your view? I would say yeah. I would say so. Yeah. You know, right. I put it up there. I put it up there with some of the top ones. Yeah. All right. Appreciate All right. it. Thanks, Douglas. How about Richard in West Virginia? You're on the Odd Couple Fox Sports Radio. There may not be another Dayton, but there's two where I'm calling from: Wheeling, West Virginia. There's a Wheeling, West Virginia, and a Wheeling, Illinois. I didn't That's right. That. Okay. <laughs> I know, like the biggest one is Springfield. There's like a million Springfields. Right. Almost one in every state. But the, the only thing is, 
Wheeling, West Virginia, you get the wheeling feeling when you're here. You don't get that in Illinois. As far as uh, <laughs> what you're talking about, I'm going with the uh, 73 win Golden State Warriors because they had Kevin Durant. Well, you mean, okay, but they that year they didn't have Durant. They didn't they have Durant. They won the next year they added Durant, remember? Oh. All right, but I, I, I hear Richard what he's saying. False information. Because that's to me, that's a that's a child. That's a legitimate call. The Golden State Warriors with Durant, Steph, Clay, Draymond. That was a great team. That would have been a, a, a wonderful series, Rob. Longtime Chicago Bulls beat writer now with Bulls.com, the legendary Sam Smith. Sam, welcome to the eye. Sam. Yeah, Is you're Sam not sitting there? too close to one another. <laughs> no, we're, no, we're, no, we're separated. We're quarantined like like the rest of America. Absolutely. So, <laughs> but how you it, doing, Sam? You and I'm doing family. well, thanks. I'm doing fine, and um, um, you, you know, there's not much to add to that. <laughs> right. Well, well, Chris and I both before you came on earlier, we were talking about you, and I wanted to say it to your face, or at least on radio, so you could hear yeah, it. Yeah, to my but ear. You were, but you were one of those guys who was out on the NBA beat, who we admired and respected when we all came through covering teams. You know, when I started out covering the Nets and all the guys who came through the NBA. So, I remember. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an unbelievable list of people. Mike Wilbon covered the the Bullets back then. Remember that? And Bob oh, yeah. Ryan, the Celtics. We could go on and on about all the people. No, I remember it, but, uh, your, buddy, your, your buddy Stephen A. helping him when he yeah. started on the Sixers beat. On the Sixers yeah. beat, absolutely. Yeah. We all did it. Chris but I just wanted cabs. to say thanks. I thanks. remember when I first met Sam, I believe In other words, that. I know what you guys are getting to, you know, uh, we appreciate what you're talking to an old timer, and we hope you don't f- fall asleep with it. No, now. not <laughs> at all, Sam. Not at all. <laughs> no, one of the all time great NBA writers for sure. Um, but Sam, let's get to we got this Bulls documentary coming up. Yeah, I heard um, something about that. Yes, yes, the last dance about the ninety seven ninety eight season. Jordan's last with the Bulls. What do you think we'll learn from this? documentary you know the average fan will learn about the bulls from this documentary it, it's it's difficult to as you know what somebody will know or, or or you know or won't when it's something something is so you know so much a part of your life you know because you, you know we we sort of live that here uh you know and it was obviously so much build up to it because of of the circumstances of you know, what was appearing to be, and, you know, what Phil labeled the last dance. So, basically, it was a declaration to everybody that, you know, and, you know, for the most part, the world didn't want Michael Jordan to be done. So, um, I'm interested myself to see, you know, how they present it. Um, now, now, Sam, help, we, we, Chris and I, we get into this with a lot of millennials and about the who was better, Michael Jordan and LeBron James. But talk about just how different the game was, how physical, how Michael used to have to deal with the Pistons and the Knicks and some of the other teams around the league. And and uh, how, you know, when he first came in the league, about the, the, the Celtics with all the Hall of Famers on it, the Pistons, you know, all these teams that he had to try to beat who had Hall of Famers and who were better than him. And he still, in the beginning of his career, he struggled, to, you know, to get to that point. But eventually, he broke through. Yeah, you know, you know it, was, it was kind of an interesting dichotomy because, you know, I, I was thinking about some of that when Tiger Woods. You know, it was, you know, the, Michael got criticized quite a bit in the '90s, you know, because he didn't win in the '80s when it was Bird and Magic and, right, you know, Moses and Dr. J, Isaiah, all these great players at their height, and then you get into the '90s. And, you know, the guys he's beating in, in, in the finals are, you know, Carl Malone, uh, Barkley, after, after moving, you know, there were those, you know, Knicks teams who were, you know, a little over the edge as far as, you know, physical play and aggressiveness. Right, yes. But lesser, you know, uh, you know, led by guys like uh, Mason, you know, obviously Patrick Ewing, you know, all time. Well, John but, Starks, but I get it. Mason right. Starks. You know, I mean, G, you know, what was then G League kind of players, guys who come out of there. So the notion, you know, the criticism they were saying about Michael is, you know, with Sean Kemp and Gary Payton one year, 
is you're not beating anybody. You, 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 you know, and so, you know, Michael Singh was always, well, I cannot, you know, we can only beat who they put in front of us. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the interesting thing, you know, just to go back a second about that 97, 98, it, it is really an incredibly rich time. And, and I'm interested to see actually, you know, if they got it, if they understood, you know, because there was such dynamic to it. And we, we like to paper over the past and, and make it seem, you know, often like a story that, you know, the pieces fit. But, but that, you know, that was a very bizarre grouping, not, not just for the players, you know, with Rodman and, you know, being added. And, you know, Dennis really at the end, you know, part, part of the deal with Dennis at that part was, you know, he was kind of, You'd say, well, Dennis was out of control. He but, was out there, but, Sam. He was wearing dresses and uh, eye yeah. mascara. Yeah, he but had, it wasn't so much, you know, it wasn't so much that as that he, he would worn out. And if you, you remember, the, you know, the next year was the lockout. And when he came out of that lockout, he was done. You know, he, he went to the Lakers and he went to Dallas and he destroyed those teams. He couldn't, you know, he, his, his skill level, it's like a great boxer. You, great boxers don't lose it in the fight. They lose it sort of between fights is what they always say. Right. And, and it was that, like that with Dennis. And, and it, it was, uh, that was coming, you know, it was coming apart the second half of that season. And, the, you know, there also was the drama with Pippen, who basically declared himself a free agent that season. And you know, he so, was hurt for half of that year too, wasn't he? Well, and, yeah, and that was sort of the underlying part of it. He 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 was, he was in his feud with the uh, the Bulls, so he held off. He, you know, and Jordan and 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 Phil were furious about this. That that you know both were unsure about coming back for that season after the ninety ninety six ninety seven. Uh, but part of it was they knew uh, Pippen had one more year, and they felt it had been inappropriate, you know, to leave him alone like that and make him play it out. And so it was sort of to finish it up. And so Pippen uh, needs surgery, but doesn't want to get it until September. Uh, decides to get it so he could miss the purposely miss the first part of the season. <laughs> uh, you know, and and that's how it been. I mean, you can imagine those kind of things going on in this era. And then when they right. went on that first road trip of the year, he couldn't play, but he went, and he announced during the trip, he, he went to a reporter and announced on the trip that he's never, ever going to play a game for the Bulls again. <laughs> so, wow. You know, and wow. so, okay, welcome to the 97-98 season. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, like I said, I'm interested to see how they depict some of these things that went on, because, and, 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 and that, was, that came after a media day, in which Jordan, of course, he never showed up the first day of media day. He would come the second day. But the first day was, was when uh, uh, Jerry Krause put, I mean, Phil had talked about this with ownership, so they knew that he didn't want to return for the next season. But Jerry Krause put out a press release basically saying, even if the Bulls go 82-0, and 0, Phil is, <laughs> Phil's not coming back. <laughs> but but so, wasn't that, but Sam, that was crazy. part of, because Michael Jordan said he would consider it if Phil was coming back, and then... They put that. Uh, they no, and that's not really. It's not really. See, and that's why I'm interested to see. Tell me why. You know, how me they then. portray it. So what happened was, you know, Phil had this thing in in his mind, and he talked about it a lot. That, you know, your voice gets lost with a team after seven years, and and, and some of it comes from his parents were Pentecostal ministers, and he he believed that with a congregation that a congregation stops listening to the preacher after seven years. And so, hmm. and he said that he always felt the same thing with a coach. And so his seven years was ending in 95, 96. So of course, they, you know, the greatest team ever, 72 games, win the title. And, and he still was thinking of quitting. But so the players go to him, a couple of players, Ron Harper and a couple others, literally went to his house, asked him to come back for that season. So they cut, he comes back and they win. But then he tells ownership. He had a meeting with the Jerry Reinsdorf during the finals when they were in Park City uh, when, we, when we were in Utah. And he met with him and, and, and told Jerry Reinsdorf he's not coaching after next season. He'll come back this one more season. He and Michael discussed it. And, but he's not coaching after 97, 98, no matter what happens. Now, Jerry, of course, misjudges this and, because he knows Phil has said this, but puts it out like he's saying it. So it made it look like Phil was kind of being fired going going into that last season, where Phil had made it clear. And they had even, Jerry Reinsdorf had offered Phil a five-year deal, 
during that finals of ninety seven of ninety six ninety seven. But Phil said, "Look, the, the team is going to come apart. It's going to be rebuilding. You know, Michael Scotty's going to leave. Michael's older is not going to stick around that long. I don't want to be part of a rebuilding team." So Phil turns down this contract. He doesn't want it. Um, you know, so those are the elements that led up to it. Even though it's depicted as, you know, it's often depicted as Kraus ran out everybody. Now he Kraus wow. was anxious to rebuild, and and a little How's too that anxious. Out? But he knew it was coming. <laughs> it, it didn't work out well. Right. It, didn't, it didn't work out well at all. But we've seen these rebuildings rarely work out well, frankly. Right. Um, Sam, we get we right. got to run there. Dude. Sam, we got thank you. Break to go. Thank you very much uh, for the time. We, yeah, I'd you like know, to you get guys, you on again. Somebody could do ten parts on this. Right. Yeah, we could. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Right. All hey, right, Sam. Thanks a lot. Well. Right, Be fellas, safe. Good to talk to you again. Stay yeah. well. See you.